Um, good day to everyone and welcome to the Transporters Insight webinar. My name is uh, Jay Mar Portillo. I am a senior marketing associate at Nano Technologies, and I will be your host for this session today. We are thrilled to have you join us today as we get insights into the world of membrane transporters. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, cover some housekeeping information. So by default, your video is off and your audio will be muted. This session um, is being recorded. So by staying in the session, you give us consent um, um, by, by using the record. Um, there would be a Q&A, a joint Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And we invite you to kindly write your questions uh, throughout the course of the presentation in the chat. So please uh, write the name of the speakers um, so that we know um, to whom you're directing uh, the questions there. Okay. And concerning the webinar, today we will start with an introduction that will be given by Dr. Andre Batson. Andre is a senior scientist and principal investigator at Nanion Technologies, and he's currently working uh, as part of the team, uh, as part of the server team, sorry. Then we will move on with the first presentation of the day that will be given by Pavel Loiko from the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, Pavel, he is a biochemist trained at the University of Copenhagen and currently um, a graduate student at Irina Borodina's group. He will give us insight into uh, his current project, uh, which is about characterizing the transporter's function using continuous exchange, cell-free synthesis, and solid-supported membrane-based electrophysiology. Then we will move on to the second uh, speaker of today, who is uh, Dr. Joseph Primau from the University of, of Alberta. Um, Joseph has a background in biochemistry and uh, chemistry. He is specialized in membrane transporter, especially in the structure and function. He is currently working in the group of Howard uh, Young, and his work is focusing on the elucidation of the function of small peptide regulators on membrane transport of cations. So without further ado, we can get started with the webinar. And it is my pleasure then to leave you with my colleague, um, Andre Batson. So when you're ready, Andre, you can start sharing your screen. I'm going to start with some introductory slides and uh, one announcement at the very end. So first, uh, a few words about Nanyang Technologies. Um, our core expertise is from the very beginning automated patch clamp, and uh, we have uh, various devices of different throughput capabilities. What you see here is our showroom with my colleagues working on different synchro patch devices. Um, that's the device with the highest uh, throughput capabilities on the market. And um, a second field of expertise is membrane biophysics. And uh, that section covers our orbit product family and also our surfer product family, where you will hear um, about some applications in today's webinar. And what you see here in that picture is actually the other half of the showroom um, where my colleagues working on the surfer devices. So in front, you witness Rocco working on the surfer N1, and in the back, colleagues working on the surfer 96 SE, which is our higher throughput surfer device. So a few words about the background. So how does the surfer actually work? Um, the surfer employs solid supported membrane based electrophysiology and in literature you will find abbreviations like SSM or SSME. This technique was invented in the early 1990s and uh, this was done because um, people wanted to measure uh, or wanted to find electrophysiological measurements to um, detect slow transporters and um, intracellular target proteins that were hardly accessible using conventional electrophysiology like um, patch clamp back then 
and uh, uh, bilayer technologies. Surfer is um, the product line and this stands for Surface Electrogenic Event Reader. And we actually have two products in that product line, which is the Surfer N1 and the Surfer 96 SE with different throughput. And I will go into a little more detail later. So how does the technology work? Or there are a few key concepts I want to introduce that distinguish SSME from patch clamp, for example. First of all, this technology um, is cell-free, so there is no um, running cell culture required. You can measure target proteins in their native environment, like in their native organelle. You can even measure purified proteins reconstituted into proteoliposomes. And the fact that the whole measurement is cell-free also enables a high uh, assay flexibility because you don't need to care about living cells and uh, um, physiological conditions. So you can go to really extreme conditions for, for basic research, for example. And here in that picture, you see one vesicle absorbed to the sensor. Actually, it's millions of them, and that enables a high signal amplification compared to patch clamp. Second point um, is that we are measuring substrate-induced responses. So our devices actually represent pipetting robots. They inject substrates to the sensor, and that substrate gradient stimulates the, um, the response, the transport activity. And this happens at zero millivolt. There is no voltage clamps. There is no voltage at that um, time point. And um, of course, you can measure multiple recordings sequentially because in between recordings, the substrate is washed off the sensor and initial conditions are restored. The third important thing to consider is that we have a capacitive readout. So the sensor is a capacitive sensor and that's in contrast to conventional EFIS where you measure steady state currents. So what happens is the substrate gradient acts as a driving force to stimulate transport. The transport um, accumulates charges if the transport is electrogenic. And this um, generates a voltage across the target membrane. That voltage acts as a counter force to the substrate gradient. And um, after a few hundred milliseconds, a new equilibrium is reached where the transport is stopped. So you actually see a current decay and then um, you see no net current anymore. So here after substrate application, here's an example. You see a peak. This peak actually reflects the um, transport rate under steady state condition because voltage has not built up yet. And then you see a current decay. And uh, after the Substrate application, substrate is washed off again, and what you see is actually an off current representing substrate efflux, charge efflux, initial conditions are restored, and you can rinse and repeat. Last point, there is uh, um, a quite good assay quality. Um, we have very high success rates uh, in the range of 98%. We have very high reproducibility, um, also a consequence that we don't use living cells. And the whole thing is HTS compatible. So here are the two surfer platforms. Again, um, I don't want to bore you with uh, too many technical details, such um, uh, only so much that um, the surfer N1 is a single bell instrument, meaning one recording at a time, while the Surfer 96 SE is based on 96 sensor well plates, so 96 parallel recordings. Um, essays generally are transferable across both instruments. Typically, uh, customers start with a Surfer N1 because it's an easy to learn device. Uh, you, can, you are very flexible with essay development and then when higher throughput is needed, uh, you can easily upgrade to the to the SE and uh, apply the the assays there. So if you want to dig deeper into uh, the surfer technology or SSME in general, 
uh, here are a few resources. Uh, first of all, we have a demo video on YouTube um, where we go through sensor preparation, measurements, and data analysis. Um, so you can see everything in action. We have two book chapters uh, about technical details and workflows using the Surfan one. And there are two recent uh, studies from last year, one about uh, transport and binding currents recorded on SGLT1. And um, another one about uh, TMEM 175, uh, which we recorded um, in native lysosomes. And uh, this is the announcement I want to make. Um, as um, many of you are probably aware, we offered the opportunity to apply for a research grant to get a SURFA N1 for free in the past. And uh, we provided that uh, device like for a certain period of time, including all consumables, totally free to support your research. And uh, this research grant will be back and open for applications in July this year. If you are interested, um, please use the QR code or the link here to register your interest, and then you will be notified via email when we are open for applications. So with that, um, I hand over directly to Paul for the first real talk of this webinar. So you can, you can take over. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for a lovely introduction. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, as Andre said, uh, there's many different applications to use the surfer, and I'll be talking about one application that we have used in our lab. Uh, so, um, uh, as the main title says, our main uh, usage of the surfer was in characterizing transporter function using continuous exchange cell-free synthesis combined with, uh, uh, with the surfer or the salt supported membrane-based electrophysiology. I'll, I'll briefly just say something about me. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Yeast Metabolic Engineering Group at the Biosustainability Center at the Technical University of uh, Denmark under the professor uh, Irina Borodina, you might find it a bit counterintuitive that we are working on transport proteins when it's a yeast metabolic engineering lab, though the utilization of uh, transports has been recently applied to metabolic engineering processes, since you can then either incorporate different transporters that can either uh, take up different alternative substrate, or you can use them as exporters so they can export your compound of interest, or you can direct fluxes within your cells. Mm -hmm. So I'll just have a small agenda for what we have installed for my talk today, which is basically the introduction to the cell-free protein synthesis that how we combined it with uh, the SSMB, uh, our transporter synthesis and characterization workflow with some result and a conclusion based on that. So the first thing to ask would be, what is uh, cell-free protein synthesis? Cell-free protein synthesis is basically uh, in vitro protein synthesis in a beaker. So you have all your required um, uh, in, in vivo translational uh, machinery as well as transcriptional machinery that you can utilize to transcribe your DNA and you can then uh, translate it into a, a, a protein. A point is the, the protein can be different. So it can be different, either an enzyme or it can be a membrane protein or a transporter or whatever you so choose. This application dates back from the 1960s as it was one of the main, uh, uh, main applications, how they deciphered the uh, polyribo nucleotides and from which they actually got the Nobel Prize for this. So there are different kinds of considerations that you need to have when you're using cell-free systems or when you want to synthesize your proteins in a cell-free manner. So the first thing that you want to do is you have, you have your extract. So you want to have your, all your machinery that's present within the cells that actually do the protein synthesis. You want to have that present to be able to actually synthesize your protein. So, uh, the required machinery, like ribosomes, synthases, initiation factors, 
uh, elongation factors, chaperones, or other things uh, that are needed for the protein synthesis, as well as other additional constituents, such as uh, salts, amino acids, uh, nucleotides, and more cold factors. So to be able to synthesize your protein, you need some kind of template. So this template can be in uh, either uh, uncoupled uh, template, which is basically your uh, mRNA that you incubate with, or it can be a coupled template, which you will basically have your DNA sequence or your vector of interest, either uh, circularized or linearized. And then it's going to be transcribed and then translated into the coded protein sequence or the protein that you want to have. Uh, then another consideration when utilizing the self-reporting system is that you need your live state organism or your cell life state that you are using for your trans translation needs to be at least optimized for your transporter or your protein of interest. As with uh, uh, different uh, organisms, some organisms require different uh, post-translation uh, machinery. Thus, before you actually invest time into using the cell system, you need to consider what kind of protein is my protein. Is it a eukaryotic protein, a prokaryotic protein? Which kind of system do I, do I need to use for it? So the mostly most common system that we have at least used was the prokaryotic from E. coli, uh, which we just had the cell line sets and all the uh, machinery from E. coli, and then can translate into, can translate the proteins or the transporters of interest. But there's also a variety of different other uh, 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 cell line sets from different organisms that can be used if you're working with uh, mammalian proteins or proteins that require some modifications afterwards. These are, range from plant cells, insect cells, other yeasts, as well as uh, uh, chow cells. So what is the cell-free reaction? So cell-free reaction is basically a reaction in a small tube. So uh, either a small tube, or it can be an Eppendorf, or it can be a small container. So the reaction is basically that you have your reaction mixture. So the place where your translation is happening along with uh, a supplied buffer that you can have with different constituents of interest. These reactions as with, for example, fermentation can be made in different manners. So in a batch fermentation, in a batch uh, reaction and a continuous flow reaction where you constantly supply new constituents to increase your yield of your proteins. It can be a continuous exchange, as we have done in our case, where you, your two uh, mixtures or your two, yeah, your two mixtures, uh, the feeding mixture, which is uh, co comprises of all the constituents such as ATP, your ribonucleotides, uh, your amino acids, and then your reaction to that. Every time the reaction mixture uses up all those other ones, you will have influx of uh, the other constituents that can then prolong the reaction with, uh, with more protein being synthesized. And likewise, we also have uh, the, let's see, the bilayer reaction, where it's basically the two reaction mixtures are separated by different kind by uh, interface. So to be able to synthesize transporters, we also need some kind of stabilizing agents. As, as we know, transporters usually are present, well, for the most time, are present within, uh, within hydrophobic environments. So we need to mimic this kind of environment to be able to have successful synthesis and a functional transporter that has to be synthesized. So there's a different variety of stabilizing agents and you can add detergents that can form simple uh, lipid bilayers or on micelles, or you can be more exotic and use different kinds of uh, uh, stabilizing agents such as bicells, also determined bicells, liposomes, nanodisks, which is what we have used in our case, in our application, or you can have a more very exotic thing where you kind of have a tethered uh, lipid bilayer to a gold layer and then have your transporter be synthesized. So, see, so 
the reaction is basically a reaction that takes place uh, in the beaker, or oh, sorry, in the beaker in the Eppendorf tubes or in a uh, reaction, reaction chamber of your interest, where you add all the constituents, the polymerases, the ribosomes, the energy required from ATP, nucleotides, amino acids, and of course your tablet of interest, along with different stabilizing agents that you can provide, detergents, uh, reducing agents, or and nano discs or different kind of other carriers that you can have. The advantages for this is that it's highly, <clears throat> it's very easy to optimize this uh, process. It's very quick. It's an open system that you can just uh, sample uh, indiscriminately. But the limitations so far is that depending on your protein, you need to optimize it more. So you might need to add different kinds of chaperones or your large proteins will be aggregating since currently there might be some limitations on what kind of size your protein can be synthesized to. And so uh, our basic workflow as we have uh, created it is that we have the transport synthesis and the characterization afterwards. So in our case is that we have our uh, expression vector with our transport gene of interest, which we subsequently uh, mix in our reaction and in our reaction mixture. Um, the protein gets synthesized and then the protein is either tagged with an epitope tag or tagged with some different tag that you can then purify it by simple chromatography. A purified protein sample can then be reconstituted into proteoliposomes. And then the functional ASIC can then take place. So in our case, we use the surfer for, to do the functional assessment. But if you so require, you can also do other uh, or more intricate or less intricate uh, functional assessment. But in our case, we used it to we use the SSME surfer to basically characterize our electrogenic proteins. So I'll go over some of the small results and how we actually applied uh, the surfer with uh, our purified proteins and our proteins of interest. So, and our uh, protocol or our workflow, we basically wanted to combine these two things with the um, selfie system combined with the uh, uh, with the characterization by way of the surfer. So we chose four proteins from uh, E. coli, which were of different uh, families, two other different families at least, with the EMRE, the small uh, multi-drug resistant um, protein, which uh, for the most part um, transports um, quaternary ammonium ions along with other different kinds of um, uh, uh, ammonium ions. We went for the classical uh, LACY, which has been studied widely, where the main subject is uh, lactose, along with uh, cation proton antiporter, the NA NAA, which transports sodium, and another small multi drug resistant protein from E. coli, the SHOG E. So, which uh, which its main substrate is a uh, guanidium ion. So we, our idea behind this was that it was for already characterized and known transporters due to the fact that uh, we wanted to have a workflow and we wanted to, we wanted to um, show this workflow or corroborate that this workflow with the self-reporting synthesis of transporters actually works. So we wanted to have some known proteins to actually analyze, to actually say something about this, uh, uh, about our workflow. Since of course, we could have taken different kinds of uh, unknown proteins or unknown transports and then try to characterize it, but then we wouldn't be able to troubleshoot whether our protocol didn't work or uh, the transporters were not functional. Likewise, for the one eukaryotic transport that we looked at was uh, the uh, AAC2 from Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is the uh, mitochondrial carrier. So as Andre said, SSM was also an option to, or a method to actually study um, 
proteins or transporters that are not present in the plasma membrane, like with other uh, electrophysiological methods. So this is kind of goes in line with that idea as well. So how did we see? So the first thing that we actually wanted to do, and then the first thing that you would um, consider is when you're using different kinds of um, stabilizing agents, whether it be your detergents, your nanodisks, your liposomes, you actually need to see whether your protein is getting expressed and incorporated into these uh, nanodisks or in the detergents of your choice. So in our case, we had our tagged proteins well, we tagged our proteins with GFP to be able to assess the fluorescence in our supernatants since the basic protocol for the synthesis, the synthesis is that you have your reaction mixture after a certain time, time period, you would collect your reaction mixture, centrifuge it down and take your solubilized or your soluble protein that's supposed to be in the supernatant and then you can process it further. So. Our idea was uh, that we would see more incorporated uh, transports into our nanodisc and our supernatant, of course. Uh, from what we saw is uh, the nanodisc that we chose. We had different kinds of nanodiscs uh, with different uh, lipids present. We saw that the best incorporation that appears is when we choose nanodiscs of you know, certain uh, Lipids, the DOPG lipid was the preferable choice for our uh, for our incorporation of our transporters. So it may vary from different kinds of uh, transporters and different kinds of uh, nanodisks. Likewise, we saw that our expression in the DOPG nanodisk was successful, as we saw that for a lot of our proteins, we had a specific uh, bands corresponding to our transporter either tagged. The GFP are not tagged with the GFP, but we also saw some formation of some certain dimers and some oligomeric uh, formations. So all in all, the successful synthesis of all transporters was carried out and in our geogenesis, though we did not, of course, know whether our transporters were functional. With that, we of course turned to the surfer to uh, assess whether these transporters would work or were working. So the selfie, then the next part, which is the selfie protein synthesis workflow in the protein synthesis workflow is the transport characterization through SSME. So uh, our first uh, transporter was for the EMRE that we wanted to, uh, to characterize and see whether it was functional, which is again, is uh, uh, transporter of uh, quaternary uh, ammonium ions, which in our case was the substrate uh, tetra propyl ammonium, which is um, yeah, uh, uh, quaternary uh, ammonium ion. So in these cases, we saw that uh, for our results with uh, SSME, we saw that the incorporation um, compared to nanodisc comparing nanodisks and the detergent DDM, we saw that there we had a better uh, current when we were synthesizing our, our well, when we were synthesizing our protein in uh, the nanodisks com as compared to the DDM. Likewise, mm, it was quite evident in our study that this was happening. Uh, Comparatively, we also looked at um, the pH dependency of, um, or the impact of pH on the transport of uh, DPA plus, which we saw that the best transport was occurring at around 7.4, 7.5 pH. Uh, from this, we also obtained some other values. That, then we also wanted to turn and see uh, Photoshop E, so on the same kind of uh, idea behind our setup, synthesized Shug E. We chose uh, the guanidium, since so the guanidium transporter, which we saw good um, peak currents for, as well as we can make uh, binding curves. Uh, though when we use different kind of substrates, so substrate which were 
which uh, were more, uh, which had uh, side chains on them. We saw that um, we saw possible pre steady state currents uh, exhibited by uh, the binding of, uh, for example, ammonium uh, guanidinium uh, to the transport. So we saw these kind of effects for all the um, non guanidinium uh, uh, substrates all the time. So we judged that this would be a more pre state state current that we are observing when the uh, guanidinium has longer side chains on it. Likewise, back to the fact that we look into like wine for the same kind of uh, substrate. So that's uh, for the same kind of substrate that's uh, likewise known to transport. So we looked into the transport for lactulose, but we also looked into the transport for uh, melibios, lactulose as well. And so uh, what's basically corroborated, corroborated by the previous literature that lactose, lactose is the main substrate compared to, but like why can also uh, transport other kinds of uh, substrates that are closely similar to uh, lactose. And though Sometimes when we are synthesizing cell-free proteins, you might need to optimize the, the protein in itself, which we did with the NIH protein, um, where we had a thermal stabilized mutant that we had to, um, that we have to work with since uh, when we expressed our native or our wild type NIH, it exhibited lower uh, transport currents than what was reported in the literature. So we had to go in and actually alter the, the mutant or an alter the wild time to a specific term stabilized mutations as was seen in other publications. This we also did and kind of uh, changed or maybe not changed, but more optimized our uh, cell-free uh, procedure. And lastly, we looked into the uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae transporter, AAC2, to at least look at um, uh, small pre steady state currents that would appear uh, when the exchanger would uh, uh, transport uh, ATP and ADP. Okay, so uh, for my small concluding remarks is that we successfully employed um, this cell free system to actually express uh, functional transporters that were incorporated into nanodisks. And then we uh, functionally uh, assess these transporters to be functional or to really, we assess their function to, um, to say that they're actually functional. So to corroborate that we can actually trans, we can actually use this protocol to, um, to express, characterize, char sorry, express and characterize uh, transporters from both E. coli and uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So, mm, uh, though the cell-free system was used in combination with SSME, this can also be used in other types of assays. But for the electrogenic transporters, it's much more, uh, much more applicable with the uh, surfer, since you are able to make it more high throughput in a manner. And so that's our protocol that we have. So basically in around a week, you could be able to synthesize your transporter and then assay it by uh, the SSME. And again, I would like to thank uh, Nanayan for giving me the opportunity to give a small talk here about what we have done with, uh, uh, with our small, uh, um, Selfie system, and I would like to invite everybody that wants to know more about it to they can read the paper that has recently been published. And if you have any more questions after this uh, presentation, then please reach out to me at the email. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Pablo. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Joseph Primo. You can call me Joe. 
And uh, today I'm going to talk about um, some work that we've been uh, doing for a number of years now. This is something I started in my PhD, and we really only rounded out the the project uh, with the uh, advent of the Surfer N1 instrument in our lab. Um, this has proved to be invaluable for this type of research, and uh, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about exactly what we're doing with it. So <clears throat> I come from the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, as Edmonton is quite notorious for being a very cold city, and uh, that's not a lie. It gets very cold. It's one of the coldest uh, major metropolitan areas in the world. Um, but during the summer, during the spring, it actually gets quite nice. You get into the high 30 degrees Celsius. It's quite green. We have a lovely winter uh, river valley, but you got to balance out the wicked cold and the tons of snow in the winter with the lovely summers here in this great city. So I'm going to get right into it. <clears throat> I'm going to go into, I'm going to try and set the stage for what we are doing uh, with this lab. So given our rich understanding of contraction, we're still missing quite a bit of details in the biochemistry of its regulation, uh, specifically for skeletal muscle contraction and cardiac muscle contraction. So I have a cartoon diagram of a skeletal muscle. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is this blue webbing surrounding these myofibrils. This is the sarcoplasmic reticulum or the calcium storage organelle of the cells. And this serves primarily as a calcium storage organelle for cardiomyocytes and uh, myocytes in general. And it's basically just specialized ER. Um, calcium dynamics is integral for the regulation of contraction. I'll go into a bit more detail about that here. So what I have here is a simplified schematic of a cardiomyocyte. And what I have up here is the plasma membrane. Now during contraction, an action potential will propagate down this plasma membrane and it'll enter into these plasma membrane imaginations known as T-tubules and activate a voltage-gated calcium channel. This allows a small entry of calcium into the cell, which can then interact with the nearby calcium release channel, the reanidine receptor. This will cause a thousand fold increase of calcium into the cytosol of your target myocyte and initiate contractile elements to move and uh, perform other functions as well. So once your muscles have contracted, especially in the heart, you tend to want to relax because if you kind of contract once and that's it, patients tend not to survive. So you want to relax your muscles to begin the contraction cycle anew. This is primarily done by the sarcoendoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, or CIRCA, which is a, a P-type ATPase, which pumps calcium against its concentration gradient to refill the SR. And that's its primary role in, in uh, myocytes. Now this, now this is under tight regulation, as you can imagine, because you want to be tight, re tightly regulating muscle contraction, specifically in the heart as well as in the uh, skeletal muscle. And this is primarily done by the small transmembrane peptide segments <clears throat> that are considered, considered subunits known as the regulins. Now today I'm gonna specifically focus on sarcolipin in skeletal muscle, but there is a number of these regulins that have been identified over the years. And I'll touch upon some previous work done in the lab um, by uh, Dr. Gareth Amanius, uh, working with Francesco's group in Italy or some work that they did on phospholamine. But this today's work will be primarily focused on sarcolamine. So as I noted before, regulatory subunits of circa, uh, two of the most well-studied are phospholamine and sarcolipin. These are both integral membrane proteins. Uh, phospholamine is expressed in the cardiac and smooth muscle with sarcolipin expressed in skeletal and atrial muscle. So these act as, uh, I don't like the word inhibitors, but that's a that's a kind of colloquialism for how these peptides interact with circa. They regulate circa's calcium transport properties. And uh, most of this regulation is encode, encoded by the transmembrane domains. And these peptides have been studied for about 50, 60 years now. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a large base of knowledge identifying key residues in the transmembrane domain, which are critical for uh, regulating circa's calcium transport properties. But it's important to note that the these peptides interact with circa directly to modify its calcium transport properties so in brief we aim to investigate the interaction between these small peptide regulators and circa by using two major assays of activity 
So first we reconstitute our target peptide with circa that we extract from rabbit hind leg muscle. This is a very good analog for all circas. This is a, a fairly well accepted um, method of, of uh, utilizing this enzyme. We reconstitute circa with our target peptide of interest in a mixture of uh, lipids and detergent molecules and we can uh, uh, we can utilize this mixture and remove the detergent slowly to reconstitute these proteins into a very tightly controlled proteoliposome system. Now what's important to note about these proteoliposomes that we form is that we can control things like the ratios of protein to lipid, we can control the lipid ratios, we can control how much lipid is in there, and what's important is that these proteins are active. So we can assay the activities of circa in the presence of our target regulator through two major uh, avenues. We can function its ATPase activity, so how it hydrolyzes ATP to pump calcium across its concentration gradient. And I'll go into a bit more detail what these curves exactly look like, but basically you can plot the different levels of ATPase activity at different calcium concentrations, and then you can fit this mathematically to the Hill coefficient or to the Hill uh, Hill equation, and you can get certain types of information out of that mathematically. But what you'll note is when you have circo alone, you get a certain curve. It looks like in the black here, but when you add a regulator, you tend to get a change in how uh, this enzyme interact uh, enzyme pumps calcium, and that's going to be important a little bit later. Now, secondly, which is kind of the primary focus of this nanon webinar, is we've been utilizing the surfer n1 instrument to directly look at calcium translocation because while we can function its atpas activity that is not necessarily coupled directly to calcium translocation either it could be small changes so these are just two different ways to measure calcium transport properties of circa <clears throat> okay so as i noted earlier phospholamine and sarcolipin directly modify circa's calcium transport properties uh, how it's been done has been pretty hotly debated in the p-type ATPase world for some years now. Um, several groups have identified an inhibitory groove formed in the transmembrane domain of circa, which can then uh, nestle in the regulating peptide and then modify circa's calcium transport properties. And this has been identified using uh, crystal structures. Uh, our group has identified it using two-dimensional crystallography. Um, however, these crystal structures represent a static conformation, and circa is highly dynamic. So <clears throat> the inhibitory groove is constantly changing shape during its reaction cycle. And then this begets the question, what role does circa's conformation play on how these peptides interact with circa and regulate, regulate its calcium transport properties? So this is something that's been touched on in the lab before, and I believe Francesco is actually in the audience, so it's nice to meet you, Francesco, finally. Um, <clears throat> we've previously seen and published on this phenomenon in the lab, as outlined in this, in, this, uh, in this paper by former lab member Dr. Armanius uh, from our group and uh, another former member, Jesse Back, and uh, other U of A uh, professors, Joanne Lemieux and Howard Young. Uh, what we had found is that, uh, and I'll just briefly go into this, I strongly recommend you go read this article, but essentially we found that there is a substrate dependent initial conformational memory of circa and circa in the presence of phospholambin. And what's important to note is that these substrate dependent initial conformations persist over multiple turnover events, which then alter circa's calcium transport properties. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to go into a bit more detail about that now. And hopefully I don't go over time. <clears throat> so uh, as I noted earlier, circa has a highly dynamic reaction cycle and different substrates stabilize different E2 to E1 intermediates. And that's indicated here. Well, the take home message I want you to take from the slide is that if you add different substrates, it changes circa shapes. And I noted earlier that I showed you a, a curve of how we can identify the ATPase activity of circa using a coupled enzyme assay. And this is a bit more of a in-depth uh, curve that I showed earlier, but basically what I want you to note is that when you reconstitute circa alone and circa with a regulator like sarcolipin, you get changes in ATPase activity. And one of the signature changes of sarcolipin 
but it is tend to see depression in the Vmax or the maximal output of circa and the apparent calcium affinity. And this will be a bit more important later. So what was previously determined by our uh, former lab mates, a uh, former lab mate and Francesco's group is that <clears throat> when you modify the initial conditions of an experiment, there are vast implications downstream for the continuous uh, turnover of circa. So we change the starting conditions by uh, using different pre-incubation conditions, and this can affect repeated turnover events downstream. And this is uh, <clears throat> this has been dubbed conformational memory. So the, again, the initial conformation alters downstream calcium transport, which also uh, alters the phospholamide interaction in the circuit. Let's see if this can work. So there's a lot going on in the slide here. What I want you to take home from this slide is general changes. So you're gonna see there are a number of different starting conditions, but I want you to note that there are changes, not just in between circa and circolipin under certain car, uh, start, starting conditions, but also in between the starting conditions. You can see vast changes. So when you have substrate uh, substrate free pre-incubation compared to uh, calcium pre-incubation or what we would call physiological pre-incubation or ATP pre-incubation, you get changes. So I've highlighted below here some of the key differences that we'll see just graphically to make it a bit simpler. But what you'll note is that the largest changes occur in the Vmax and in the apparent calcium affinity, except for a certain set of conditions. So when you pre-incubate with ATP or you pre-incubate uh, with what we would call physiological conditions, and this is low baseline levels of calcium and a set concentration of ATP, which would more mimic kind of the basic physiology of a, uh, of a cardiomyocyte in the background, you'll see that the calcium affinity actually doesn't change very much between these two conditions, but you do get a slight change in the maximal output of the enzyme. So I'll slightly change gears to you here and bring to your attention a phenomenon that suggests that sarcolipin might incur something called non-shivering thermogenesis. The evidence of this was identified in mice, and I suggest you check out this work by Bal and Periasimi back in 2020, where they identify something called non-shivering thermogenesis. This is thought to be an inefficiency in circa that's been utilized by these animals to generate heat in the absence of shivering. Now, this is, uh, <clears throat> we wanted to see if we can uh, if we can recapitulate these these uh, these effects on a uh, from a molecular biology point of view, and to do that, we wanted to directly monitor calcium translocation, and with that, we utilized the Surfer instrument, which kind of really wrapped up this project. So I'm not going to go into great detail um, about how this system works because Andre did that earlier, but I will just kind of go over the basics of our experimental procedure where we add our non-activating solution to kind of clear the cells. We then add our activating solution, which then uh, necessitates circa to pump calcium into our, our proteoliposomes, which then induces a change in current that is then measured by the instrument. Then we flush with non-activating solution, which allows removal of the, cal of the calcium ions from this. And we have calcium ionophore present in these reactions as well. And what we have here is a typical trace of one of these experiments. And this is kind of uh, what we usually see when we run these experiments. And I have underneath here, just kind of a, a little roadmap for what's happening. I've highlighted what we're interested in detecting from these particular experiments. We're looking at the peak current here, which is the maximum current of, of, uh, of this um, of the experiment. And then the integration of this curve, which can, which can be uh, simplified as the calcium the total calcium translocation of this unit. So similar experiments were performed by the previous group with Gareth and Francesco, uh, where they did observe that there was a substrate dependent charge translocation with phospholamide present. I believe they did do a bit of experiments with sarcolipin um, as well. So we went in a bit more detail with sarcolipin, and this right here is just a, an example of the different conditions we use. I'm not going to go into all the different conditions um, that we use. That should hopefully be published pretty soon. Um, we did 
submitted for publication. <clears throat> um, what I have here is basically what uh, what we were recording. And I have here is a three-dimensional plot of the individual traces that have been averaged. Uh, I believe this is like 50 or 60 different uh, traces that were averaged and plotted from ascending calcium concentration here. And then the peak current was then measured and plotted here and fitted to the Hill equation. And the calcium translocation or the charge translocation has also been fitted to this. And you'll note that there are slight differences actually between these, uh, similar to what we have seen with ATPase activity. So what you'll note is that in the presence of sarcolipin, we get differences in, uh, in these curves, representing a reduction of charge movement and a shift in calcium affinity. So I've highlighted here some key findings from our work, uh, the maximum peak current and the calcium affinity of charge translocation located here. The take home message from this is that while we do see differences based on subject dependent conformations, we do not see evidence of ATPase uncoupling. We're not seeing a huge amount of ATPase activity with very little calcium translocation. That's not being well represented in this data. But what we do note is that we're seeing persistent effect of sarcolipin on multiple turnover events. And this suggests that sarcolipin remains associated with circa and its association is modified based on substrate induced conformations. So if you recall, sarcolipin can bind to multiple, uh, can bind to circa and it um, is conformation dependent. Uh, oh, pardon me, let's, let's revisit this. I'm jumping ahead of myself here. So uh, I'm gonna speak a bit about conformational memory of circa. And this is something that Francesco's group has been working on for a while now. This is what was touched upon with Garrett's, um, Garrett's paper is that confirmation dependent starting conditions dictate the following reactions. They dictate how circa behaves under different starting conditions. So large domain movements are not random, but are driven by availability of substrate. Uh, changes to confirmations can persist through multiple reaction cycles. The modifications that alter this activity are slower to return the baseline of the reaction cycle. So maybe we've identified in between intermediates. And I believe we are touching upon where sarcolipin actually fits into this conformational memory. So with that, I'm going to uh, wrap things up here um, and note what we have found that sarcolipin is capable of multiple modes of conformation dependent interaction with circa. Once a particular mode is engaged, it persists through multiple turnover events. Sarcolipin interacts with circa throughout the transport cycle. And we do not unfortunately uh, detect any uncoupling of ATPI's hydrolysis from calcium transport. So it seems to contradict the thermogenesis model, not saying that it's completely contradictory. There might be a bit more, uh, the group that was looking at these in mice, there's probably a lot more at play then than just the basic fundamental molecular biology that we're investigating. But um, it's an important first step into understanding what's going on. So that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Nanine team for uh, inviting me to give a talk. I'm uh, very happy to talk about my, my science and research. Uh, I've acknowledged uh, several labs for their contributions to this project, as well as my lab mates um, and uh, some former workers on this project and uh, my funding agencies. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Joe, for the for the nice overview of your of your work, your research. So I think um, we can then open the Q and A session. Um, so yeah, it's just an invitation for you all. If you have any questions, uh, if something was unclear, or if you're curious, uh, you can type them here in the chat. And if you would like to formulate the question yourself, you can use the raise hand option here uh, as well. And I will call your name so you can ask the question yourself. Um, let me check here. I uh, we had actually some questions coming through um the presentation from from Pavel. Um, so I have here um a couple from you, Pavel. Um, let me just put this where I can read it better. Uh -huh. so. Um, someone was asking here about the post-translational modification for eukaryotic uh, proteins. Uh, do they also happen in the synthesis buffer? Uh, 
Okay, so they can happen. That depends on what kind of uh, cell lines that you'll be using. So if you're using uh, cell lines that's more mimicking the eukaryotic system with uh, glycosylation or phosphorylation, then yes, it will be able to phosphorylate it. Okay. Uh, one second here. Um, could you also for Pavel? Uh, could you speculate? Uh, or what's the theory? Uh, why specifically the OPG seems to be the preferred lipid? Um, uh, one second, I lost. And the preferred lipid for the reconstitution of of the proteins of the transporters. Mm, well, yes, I, I can speculate. It basically uh, is how the chains like surround the hydrophobic uh, contacts between the transporters. So, depending on what kind of um, um, like hydrophobic residues you have, uh, you'll be able to form different kind of distortions. So uh, my speculation is that uh, it has this more flexibility to uh, to actually um, form around these uh, around these hydrophobic layers in the transporters. So. Okay, maybe a follow up question on on that about the lipids. I. Uh, remember the slide where you uh, showed about the different lipid compositions? Is there um, or did you try any mixture of lipids or was it like only one one lipid for the nano disks? Uh, so no, uh, basically what we did was just uh, try only the ones. You could do it with the uh, with the mixtures, though I have not uh, tried it myself. No has. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see what's coming. Um, oh yeah, so I think uh, there was here one in the chat for Joseph. <laughs> uh, if you could go over the calcium jump, but I see you were already um, writing something. Yeah, so if I could share my screen really quick, I can, sure. uh, I can show Adele uh, Hussein uh, yeah. what we're looking at here. So hopefully this shows up here. So can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is the uh, calcium jump experiments that we performed, or uh, I, I like to designate these by their pre-incubation conditions. So this has been pre-incubated under ATP uh, with ATP, and then we induce the activity of of uh, circa using uh, using um, calcium. So presumably, what we think is happening is that we are uh, adopting an E2 ATP like um, structure. Um, which is indicated here. Uh, the actual uh, data that we collected is indicated here. These are the traces that have been averaged out over 50 or 60 different traces. And what you'll see, Circa alone adopts this type of curve. And Circa, in the presence of sarcolipin, is significantly diminished comparatively. You can see that here. Um, and that's indicated here as well in the uh, peak current measurements and in the charge translocation measurements. So we're seeing a depression in Vmax, and I believe this is actually even lower than um, than the others. Then this is the lowest overall, I believe. Let's see if I can find that here. Um, but yes, this is uh, this is what we saw with the ATP pre-incubation conditions, and we have we have a full report of these um, coming out hopefully in Biophysical Journal should they accept our, uh, our sample. Does that help? Does that answer your question, Adele? Wonderful, thank you. Um, there is another question here in the chat. I presume this is for you also, Joe. Um, can you use, no, can you see the deuterium solvent isotope effect on turnover using this technology with the lactose permease? I think that one is for, for oh, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah, I think this one is for me as well. So, but uh, uh, I personally, I have not tried it, and I have not read anything about uh, uh, this uh, effect. So I can't uh, be certain about. I can only speculate. But um, to my speculation, so I can jump in. Uh, yes. Sorry. To, to, but, but there is a publication um, with, with SSME looking at the deuterium effect on similar transporters. 
So yeah, you can you can measure the deuterium effect. It's quite prominent. So that's that has been published actually. Um, yeah, there's another one coming here for Pavel as well. Um, did you screen different sizes of uh, nano disks to incorporate the transporters? And also, if the um, if the PLs don't merge with the lipid layer on the server. Uh, so we did test. Uh, we only, I think, as far as I recall, had one size of nano disk. We didn't. Uh, change the size of the nanodisks. We kind of wanted to have, to have the uniform size of the nanodisks. If I recall right now, it was 18 nanometers. I can't recall off the top of my head, but no, we didn't screen the different sizes, just the one size. Um, uh, and the merging with the binary on the server. Uh, I'm not sure like, uh, I completely understand the question. Uh, um, so I think that he asked if the uh, proteoliposomes don't merge with the lipid layer on the surfer. I think that's his question. Like to my knowledge and to my memory, uh, they should merge, but uh, I can't really like, uh, successfully answer the question. Let's put it this way. So. No, no problem. Um, I, one second, I have some coming also uh, directly to me. So I have one here for uh, Joseph. Um, have you uh, have you used other transporter um, activity assays? Um, and how do they compare to the, to the surfer assays? Or the surfer yeah, are you asking about uh, different as different types of assays or different transporters? No, for different type of assays. Uh, so we've done we've done calcium fluorophore measurements in the past, and uh, they do reflect the ATPase activity measurements we've done in the past. However, uh, it was very noisy. Um, it I don't want to say it didn't work very well because it did give us results, but it was incredibly noisy. So it's hard to get. Um, any fine uh, fine measurements out of those as well. But, uh, and I think we dabbled with radioactive calcium measurements, but I'm not a big fan of radiation <laughs> or especially radioactive calcium. So it's a, it's been uh, it hasn't been a huge priority. So uh -huh. luckily, um, I think that the, the standard coupled enzyme assay, which has been used for I think 30 years, and uh, this nano and surfer uh, technology assay. Um, are, are performing well in lieu of these other types. But yes, this is a long-winded answer to say, yes, we did try other things. Uh, we've landed on these two different types of assays that kind of fit the workflow for our lab uh, very well. But I understand there are others that other groups use as well. Okay. Uh, there's another one here for you, Joe. Um, did you notice any significant differences in the K, K, uh, KM, uh, when looking at peak amplitude or charge? Yes, yeah, we did actually. So um, <clears throat> we uh, we did notice that typically the K, what we would call uh, the KM uh, or the half maximal concentration, half maximum activity, uh, we, we label that as the apparent calcium affinity of our enzyme. Uh, we did notice that there was a shift uh, typically uh, I would say the curve is shifted to the right, indicating a, uh, a decrease in calcium affinity overall, comparing the peak amplitude curves to the charge translocation curves. How we are trying to rationalize this um, math, like mathematically, what it means enzymatically, um, we're not entirely sure why. So we're not, we typically don't, I don't say we don't trust, but we're not really reporting the Calcium, the apparent calcium affinity measurements when we are plotting the peak amplitude of these uh, of these curves, and we are focusing on the actual charge translocation aspect or the uh, integration of the of the um, the value under the curve. That's your question, Rocco. Okay, great. Yeah. 
And I think we can have a last question. Um, yes, so um, this is for Pavel. Um, uh -huh. So here. Uh, where are the long-term stability and storage conditions for the transporter nanodisc uh, complexes? Like how long, uh, how does the long-term storage affect the transporter functionality? Do you have any information on that? Mm, well, not to mind, like uh, what we have at least done, we had these stored for like one to two months and they were still uh, functional. Longer than that, we have not tested I have some like uh, proteins in the, in the freezer now. I could test it and see, but this, uh, and I can test the hypothesis, but at least three months uh, was um, uh, was a good time span or like a, a good shelf life of the uh, of the proteins. Okay, great, that sounds good. Um, so there were a couple of questions that um, I could not bring up the discussion, but in the sake of time, I think we can, uh, move on. I just want to say uh, two things, and then we can close um, uh, the webinar. So we can send these questions uh, later to you both, Joseph and Pavel, so you can have a look. Um, yeah, so maybe there are some interesting points there for, for your work as well. <laughs> so yeah, basically, I would like to thank everyone um, for participating uh, in the discussion. Also, uh, great thanks to both uh, Pavel and Joseph for joining us today. It was uh, really great insights into what you both are working on. Um, even though uh, different uh, type of transporters, it's really uh, enriching information what we got uh, here today. So thank you for that. And we will be looking out for the publications uh, that you both mentioned. Um, yes, so to close, I want to just remind you of what Andre already mentioned at the beginning. So this year we are having again um, Surfer N1 instrument grant. Um, so basically we are giving uh, the opportunity um, to, to labs to submit a project proposal so they can have a Surfer platform uh, for six months, completely free of charge, um, also consumables, the support, the installation and, and all of that. So, um, the registrations, um, the applications will be open uh, soon, but the best way to find out is if you uh, go to our website and register your interest. So as soon as, as we get the, the applications opened, you will be the ones uh, hearing about that. And yeah, if you're interested or if you know of any colleagues who would be a good fit for, for the instrument grant, so please, um, yeah, share, spread the word. Um, and last but not least, just want to mention about some of the events coming up um, that we have here at Nanion. So as you heard, uh, we have these for the grant. There's also the Nanion user meeting coming in Munich. Uh, this will be happening in October. So this is a hybrid event. Um, so you can join either online or in person. Uh, in person is of course uh, nicer. <laughs> so you have the possibility to network uh, with all of us and uh, yeah, meet fellow researchers. So if you're interested, you can also just go to our Nanio news page uh, under events or no Nanio user meeting, and you can also register there. So in general, if you don't want to uh, miss any updates from our side, we recommend you to, or invite you to subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on LinkedIn. So we are very active there and every piece of information that we have for you and what we prepare for you, we are always announcing it there. So that's all from my side. So I would like then to thank you all for being here and joining us today. So yeah, you will be hearing soon from us with the with the recording. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>